Hi, this is Vicki Gilbert Parnell. And I've come to speak with you a little bit. Uh, the Lord has had me studying the vine and the branches um, in John 15. And he's led me to, to share. Now, what I'm going to do, Lord willing, is just present to you what I have found. And you take it to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. And let him teach you as the Holy Spirit to teach you. John 14, 26. I'm just going to share the verses and share the little things he's pointed out to me. And I'm going to let the Holy Spirit lead. Today is 1-3-24. It's 2.55 p.m. my time here in East Tennessee. So let's begin with a prayer. I have been praying off and on all morning. And um, I like to keep God in everything. So let's pray. Dear sweet Holy Spirit, I ask in Jesus Christ's name you lead this prayer. Father God, in Jesus Christ's name, I submit to you. I submit my will, excuse me, I submit my will and my life to you, and I surrender to you. If I have committed any sin, known or unknown, right now, I repent, because I want my life to be a submitted, pleasing life to you. So, Father, in Jesus Christ's name, I give you praise. Now, every weapon, every device, every gizmo, every gadget, Every power of witchcraft and such like powers in all existence known to God. Because God exists everywhere, known and unknown. Including every type of, of weapon, of gizmo, gadget, device. I've already said those, Lord. I just, it's been one of them days. So I bind them all, break them all, in Jesus Christ's name, cancel them all. Every form of communication known and unknown in all existence known to God. Because God exists everywhere that's been rising up against me, this ministry, my family, and all my brothers and sisters I can cover in Jesus Christ's name, known and unknown in all existence. I cancel them. And every evil gathering, every evil gathering against me, against this ministry, against my family, against all I can cover, Lord, anybody that participates in any way with this ministry, I hereby command you in the name of Jesus Christ to disperse and to not regroup after I have placed us under the barrier of stealth and invisibility so that the enemy does not hear in Jesus Christ's name. I command and decree while we're praying so that they cannot run and formulate plans in advance to try to take and stop us down. To, to take us down and stop us. And Lord, I also decree and declare there is absolutely no retaliation. I declare it and I decree it on Job twenty two twenty eight as a child of God, as an heir and joint heir of Jesus Christ, as a child of royalty to the kingdom of God. I make this an official decree and declare it that the angels of God, I pray you would send down and ensure that they do not try to do any kind of backlash, interference, or retaliation, or such like things, known and unknown, in all existence known to God, because God exists everywhere, and God is mighty, and God is all in all, and God will ever be, will ever be, and has always been. You are the great I am. You are Yahweh. You are Elohim. You are God. You are God. You are God. You are the living God and there is none like you. And I give you praise and I exalt you. I exalt you. I praise you. I lift you up. And I pray that my prayer would be a sacrifice to you. An acceptable sacrifice. A sweet aroma among all the stench and all the, the cursings that you receive every day and every day in, day out, Father God. Let this little offering be a sweet smelling sacrifice to you i pray you will receive it in jesus christ's name every gin every trap every snare lord let it be turned upon the enemy i tear down in the name of jesus christ every veils of lies deception mirages illusions illusions and such like things known and unknown in all existence known to god because God exists everywhere. And I stand on Luke eight seventeen, Luke 12, 2 through 3, that everything that's hidden will be brought to light. Everything that's been heard, <coughs> excuse me, everything that's been heard in the dark will be brought to light in the name of Jesus. So, Father God, every enemy, every false friend, every false everything, everything false, bring it to light that's hidden in our lives. Lord, hidden in the lives of your children, Lord. Let us, and then let us, let it go. Father God, when you reveal something, we should 
obey, listen, and run. We should not be trying to get it back. So in the name of Jesus, you reveal it, Father. You reveal it, and I'll cut the cords, and I will not look back, as I have done time and time and time again. You say, let this person go. I say, yes, sir, and I don't look back. Because my life is in your hands. You know all things, and I do not. And as you've called me to separate myself, to seek your face, to seek your face, to seek your face, to seek your face, more and more I see clearly and clearly and clearly and clearly the devices and the schemes and the plots of the enemy. And I see how desperately we have to reach the lost. You have chosen to work through people. Those you have created, your hands and your feet. You have chosen to use us to be your hands and feet and to reach out to the lost. You are first and foremost a God of love. But you're a God of, of mercy and judgment and justice. And you know how short time is. And you know just like a father has to correct. <coughs> I rebuke this attack on my throat. Father God, I ask for immediate judgment for those trying to interfere. In the name of Jesus, I did not clear this room. Forgive me, Lord. Those that were here before I put us under the barrier of stealth and invisibility, I hereby bind you and wipe your memory in Jesus Christ's name. I loose you off my throat. Let go in Jesus Christ's name. And now you are bound and you are thrown into the abyss with the others. All that's been assigned to attack us right now in Jesus Christ's name. Any kind of attack against this ministry and against this. You are hereby bound and wrapped in everlasting chains. Dipped in the glorified fortified blood of Jesus. You are hereby gutted from head to toe with the sword of the spirit. Your eyes are removed all three and so is your tongue. And you will hear me forever singing Jesus Christ is the Lord. Repeatedly as you're thrown into the abyss. Where you will wait your time of trial unless Father God says otherwise. And I request heavy loads and grievous torments in Jesus Christ's name. And Lord, again, I ask that all, all notices and alarms be just declared a false alarm and that they do not know what we're doing. Father God, because without your help, you know I cannot get the, anything uploaded. I trust you. I stand in your word. You said to do this. We will do it and it will be done in Jesus Christ's name. Because no weapon formed against us shall prosper. It cannot when we line our life up with you, Jesus Christ, then the enemy cannot prevail. You will allow us to be tested like Job. Yes, especially since this year has started, the trying, the testing, the persecution like never before, the removal of the Bible. All these things are coming. So God, let us run and hide in the shadow of your wings as we face this battle head on. And Lord, let us always remember even though we have to live our lives here, we are still first and foremost warriors on the battlefield for Jesus Christ and for the lost souls. Let your perfect will be done in all things, all things, Father, on earth as it is in heaven. I pray this daily, I pray this hourly for your will to be done. And if you can use my life somehow to bring it forth, then I submit it to you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Let me get a little sip of water. Don't just love it when they try to grab your throat. <laughs> no, I, no, I do not love it. Lord, forgive me for saying that. And I, I did not clear my room. I've been in and out today. And things are tied to cling to things you bring in. I usually pray over every single thing. I had to run out, run errands, pay some bills. And I was at a place that... I prayed over, but yeah. Right, Lord, we're good now. We're cleared. Okay. Okay, this word, that what I'm going to share with you. Here's what the Lord titled it Who are you in Jesus Christ? Who are you in Jesus Christ? Which branch are you? When a person accepts Jesus Christ into their heart, and he forgives them of their sins. More occurs than just redemption and salvation. Although these are the greatest of all. These are the gifts that we can receive in this world. Redemption and salvation. 
But there, there, there's also things that change in the supernatural realm. Physical and supernatural. When you move your status from child of the earth alone to child of earth, but child of God, child of heaven, you inherit, you know, you just created, you inherited heaven, all of heaven. The supernatural, things supernaturally happen when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And of course, it does send a lot of alarms to, you know, the enemy in hell and such things. Oh no, another one. <laughs> Sorry. But heaven rejoices over every soul that, that is saved. That's how important it is. The soul is the most important thing. It is the most valuable thing in, in God's eyes, in Jesus Christ's eyes, and the enemies. Or why would they both be fighting for the soul of man? All right. I'm going to start. I'm going to read just a little bit. Because this is where he's had me reading repeatedly. John 15. I have the KJV. I'm going to read verse 1 through 17. I'm going to read it all because I'm going to break some of it down that he kept pointing out to me. And the first thing he pointed out to me, verse John, uh, John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. The true vine. He is a true vine. And my father is a husbandman, the caretaker, the the one over him. Every branch in me, branch, Christian. Every branch in, in you know, um, chosen people. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, trying and testing and purging, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. If the branch is not connected to something, it will die. Except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, you die. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Well, on Judgment Day, that's a representation of the lake of fire. You're cast into the fire and burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. When you abide with the Lord, you're living a life pleasing to him. Therefore, he will answer your prayers, because you're going to line your life up with his wills and his wants, which benefits you. See, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Right, this part of the, those want to know how do you live holy? If ye keep my commandments, and everybody knows how to read the Bible, or listen, you shall abide in my love. You want to abide in Jesus? You want to walk? You want to live holy? Keep his commandments. That's part of it. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. As a child of God, you're supposed to have joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. His friends. Ye are my friends. If you are a child of God, living a godly life, you are Jesus' friend. If you do whatsoever I command you, see there's the, the thing. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Abide in him. Command. Henceforth I call you not servants, 
for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. He shared the, the mysteries of the kingdom of God, the power of the kingdom of God. He shared everything. He shared all of all, all of him. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. You're supposed to reach the lost. You're supposed to make disciples. Go and bring forth. You have, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. In other words, you're going you're gonna to disciple them. Your fruit's not going to go bad. That your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give you. These things I commend you, that you love one another. As I've been reading this, the Lord shows me pictures of something. I was seeing the vine. You know, a picture of a vine. We know that Jesus is a vine. Also called the root of Jesse. You know, the, the root. He's the vine, the root. But here's here's what there's two branches spoken here the branches that are fruitful and the branches that are unfruitful so which which who are you in Jesus Christ which vine are you are you a fruitful vine or an unfruitful the two kinds of branches one that is profitable and bears fruit and helps the kingdom of God the other, who is still a branch of the vine, so we're still talking about Christians or people who accepted Jesus, and I know that we have the Jewish people too. I'm talking about the Gentiles, okay? I'm talking about those other than the Jew, the Jews, our blessed brothers and sisters of Israel. Okay, so another who is still a branch of the vine, but is unprofitable, not bearing fruit, useless to the kingdom of God which one are you we're going to talk about the unprofitable one first because the blessings and all for the those that are bearing fruit is ways far outweighs those who are living ungodly professing to love Jesus Christ that's who the unprofitable branches are where it says in John 15 2 Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. Okay, every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. This means, this part of the vine, this saved person, is not bearing fruit. Meaning, they're not living godly, with fruits of the Spirit evident. When you're living a godly life, you're going to have evidence. You cannot hide. You're going to have evidence. You're going to have the love of God, fruit, joy, peace. You're going to have attributes of God showing up in your life. Because when you get saved and you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, the Holy Spirit comes in too because the Holy Spirit is what convicted you and what drew you to that accepting Jesus Christ. He convicted you of your sins, meaning he made you aware that you had been sinning that, and that you needed a Savior. You needed your sins washed away. All right. So the unprofitable, the branch not bearing good fruit, it tells you right here that that branch can be cut off. It can be removed. That's what it says. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, and it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. For it to wither, it is disconnected from the vine. It is cut out, cut off. All right, I'm going to give you some more verses to go with this again. You take this to Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Okay, what this tells me 
because I started, he had me looking up the book of life. Your name can be blotted out of the book of life. I don't know what that takes, what happens to make him do that. Besides blaspheming the Holy Spirit, I do not know. All I know is he gave me these verses. He said, your name can be blotted out even after you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. We see this as possible in different examples in the Holy Bible. First example, Revelation 3, 14. Jesus Christ identifies. He's talking to Philadelphia Church. Verse 15. I know thy works. that, And again, this is a church, which we know not all churches are good, though. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would not, excuse me, I would thou work cold or hot. 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, again, this is identifying as believers, because they at one time had believed, and they've gotten cold, they've backslidden, and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He's cutting you away. He's ejecting you. He's vomiting you. We see in verse 18 and 19, when we go down further, he is reproving his own. It's still in that area. So he can reject you. Again, these are the not bearing fruit vines. I feel like I hear the Lord tell me to read that revelation. We're in Revelation 3. And I'm just going through scripture. Revelation 3, 14, uh, we'll go 15 through 16. And unto the angel of the church of the La Laodiceans. Okay, it's so the Laodiceans. I put Philadelphia. I'm so sorry. Write these things. Set, these things set the, set the amen. Okay. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He's talking to his, his own. If you're lukewarm, you're going to be spewed out. And then he goes down further to talk to him that overcometh my grant to sit on the throne. And I know a lot of people, I, I'm, I'm just telling you what the Lord has led. I'm not getting into it. This is proof. Um, there's more than just says so. When you go to Matthew 7, 16 through 20, where it talks about you shall know them by the fruit. All right, Lord. Should have had these marked. Lord, Lord. Got my pages quit sticking. In Jesus Christ's name. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And I said verse 16. So Matthew 7, verse 16 through 20. Then we're going to go to 21 through 23. All right, Holy Spirit, help me. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs of thistles? So even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that is bringing not forth good fruit tree branch is shewn down cut down and cast into the fire wherefore by their fruits you shall know them 
your life should be displaying Jesus Christ in it. People should not have to ask you if you're a child of God. They should be able to see something, if nothing else, the joy of the Lord in you. Verse 21, and this again showed me right here. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Those who are obedient, those who are living a godly life, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in my, thy name? A lot of people will prophesy in the Lord's name and I'll be right. But when you get to, and in, the na in thy name have they cast out devils. It says in the scripture, Satan cannot cast out Satan. Because if he does, his kingdom will fall. I've got that wrote down here somewhere. And the house divided will fall. You can look that up if the Lord leads. That's Mark 3, 23 through 26. And Matthew 12, 24, 28. Satan can cannot cast out Satan. And if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand and a divided house will fall. That's what these verses says. So it's saying right here. In verse 22, it's very plain. Lord, open their understanding. Many will say in that day, in, the, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Okay, many false prophets are out there. But this one, and in thy name have, have cast out devils? Only somebody filled with the Holy Spirit, in the power, working in the power of Jesus Christ's name, and cast out devils. Truly cast out devils. Demons. It's demons. So this is people that have at one time walked in the fullness of the, the Holy Spirit and, and the fullness of God and have become cold. They have become lukewarm. They have become living an unfruitful and ungodly life for Jesus Christ. And it, finishes, and it finishes, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. No sin can enter heaven. Okay, I, I promise you it's going to get better. <laughs> There's other scriptures also, a covering about them saying Lord Lord but there are, are many places where it talks about mentioning possibility of having your name blotted out of the book of life Revelation 3 5 speaks of he who overcometh I will not blot out his name out of the book of life that verse tells us right there it's possible for a name to be blotted out of the book of life it's applied knowledge you can see they're saying, I'm not going to blot your name out. So you know, if you are not an overcomer, living a godly life in Jesus Christ, one that overcometh, your name can be blotted out of the book of life. David prayed in Psalm 69, 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of living, which is the life when you look up the definition of living, um, to have life, and not be written with the righteous. The book of life is for the righteous. The righteous, we're made righteous through Jesus Christ. We're made righteous when he puts his robe of righteousness upon us. But we have to keep that robe of righteousness clean by living a godly life. And I'm going to go over that too. In Exodus 32, 32 through 33, Moses is interceding for the children of Israel after making the golden calf. And he asked the Lord to blot his name out of the book if, it was, if he will not forgive the people. God says whoever sinned would have their name blotted out. This is his chosen people, Israel. And we know that, yes, they sinned. You, when you see that, it you've got to look at the, the flip side of it. Moses is saying, well, blot my name out of your book of the righteous. Because it's so it's possible. Other verses about blotting the name out is Psalms 9, 5. 
and Deuteronomy 9.14. So this shows us some of the vine branches. These are people that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but have backslidden. Even if you're lukewarm, you're backslidden. Meaning, you went back to, to at least partially living in the world. And if you're lukewarm, you're trying to do both. Live in the world and, and live. You know, and then you have those that are backslidden that are just turned and no, no longer living the life. Okay, this, this is showing you there are people that accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they can be removed from the vine. Meaning, their name can be brought out or removed from the book of life. So how do we stay a part of this vine? Once we accepted Jesus Christ and not be removed. Again, John 15, 4-5. Abide in me. That's the secret. I mean, not the secret. That's, that's the answer. Abide in me. Abide in Jesus Christ. Walk like he did. Do what he does. Now, we know the basics. Read, study, pray, worship, fast. You know, we know the basics or should know. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. We cannot bear fruit on our own. As a child of God, we depend on Jesus Christ for everything. And Father God, he is our root. He is our root, and we draw our strength. We draw our, you know, the, from the root, you draw your nutrients. You draw everything to sustain life. Jesus is the vine, the root. All right, what happens when a tree limb is cut or broken off from the vine? It shortly dies thereafter. It It dies. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth lives. Abideth means lives. In me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, our source of new life, you can do nothing. And he's right. We can't do anything without him. But through him, we can do all things, according to Philippians 4, 19. John 5, 15, 6 says, If a man abide not in me, if, if a man chooses not to live a godly life in me, abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. And this brought me back to um, how we used to clean brush growing up. How that um, the, the tree branches would be cut off and then all the rush would be gathered up, and then we'd burn it. So this really made sense to me. So we are the branches, and our new life is possible, only possible, by living in Him. He sustains us. He's our root. He's our power, our source. So how are we to do this? I'm going to give you a few examples of some things. Again, 15, John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments... You shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. Obey. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Be obedient. Be obedient to what you read in this word you're supposed to do. You know, and there's some things, understand, like we no longer have to do the animal sacrifices under the old law, the old covenant, because we're under grace. Jesus is already our sacrifice. But Jesus taught very much from the commandments and things of that. He taught from the Old Testament. Ephesians 5, 1, 2 is an example. And I've just broke down parts of what they said. Walk in love as Christ has loved us. That's how to live a godly life. Colossians 13, 13. Forbearing, which means being patient and restrained. One another. Be patient and restrained against for one another. Don't fly off the handle as we say here in, in the South. Be patient, long-suffering with them. Restrain, you know, so you don't just overreact. 1 Peter 2, 20-22. Forgiving. Were to forgive, what was it, 7 times 70? In a day. You can look that up. I apologize, I did not write it down. Matthew 16, 24-26 says, To deny oneself, deny your flesh, deny the pleasures, and take up the cross of Jesus Christ and follow him. Meaning, live a godly life that he was our example of. Romans 12, 1 through 1. 
I'm sorry, Romans 12, 1. Keep our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. A lot of people say, well, how did I do that? Live a holy and clean life. Don't fornicate. Don't gluttony. Don't do things that's going to harm your body. I'm going to read that verse. Lord said to read it. Because I've also got number two wrote down here. You're also to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive his mind, the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ, but you have to renew it. You have to keep it pure. You have to keep your thoughts pure. And you do that by reading the word of God, studying, praying, by conversing with Jesus Christ, Father God. And you do that by casting down those thoughts and vain imaginations the enemy throws in. When you get a bad thought in your head, you do not have to keep that thought in your head. You make the choice whether to listen to it, play with it, then let it lead you into sin, or you can take authority and say, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ and I cast you out. And then I usually follow with, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. James 4, 7. Because that is the word of God. And the word of God is forever powerful. And the word of God is Jesus Christ. And all power is in Jesus Christ. And so Romans 12. Verse 1. I beseech you therefore brethren. By the mercies of God. By his mercies. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is the thing you're supposed to do. And be not conformed to this world. Do not be conformed. Do not be molded as in the image of the world. But be ye transformed. You're a new creature. You're transformed. By the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to be in God's will? You want to live a godly life? This is telling you how to do it. And be not conformed to this world. Do not let the world mold you. You are to be a separate person. Separate people. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we do it all through Jesus Christ and Father God's help and through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you how to do these things. John 14, 26 tells us he is our teacher. And he will bring all things to our remembrance that Jesus Christ has spoken. And Jesus is the word in flesh. Alright, then we have. Philippians 2, 5, and 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Is, it tells you how to keep this way of thinking, pure, pure way of thinking. Also, Philippians 4, 8, which is the, whatsoever lovely, whatsoever pure, whatsoever it's just. That's what you need. You need to be thinking on things like that. Philippians 4, 8. That's how you, you cast down these thoughts and think on these things. Philippians 2, 3, 4 also tells us part of living godly. Do nothing in strife or vain glory and esteem others of yourself. Do not cause division. Do not do anything to have yourself uplifted and stay humble. That's what that's saying. My translation. 1 Peter 1, 14-16 as obedient children, be holy even in conversation. You're to be holy in every aspect of your life. Are you giving jokes that are idle words? Are you gossiping? Are you, you know, cursing? You need to repent. But, again, you take that to the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer. Now, the benefits of being a child of God, a, a bearable, a fruit-bearing branch, far outweigh 
not being. A godly life is this. And I'm just going to read some of these and I've got a verse to go with one or more. Someone's life that is centered on Father God and Jesus Christ <clears throat> and their principles of holiness and righteousness and his lives reflect their values and attributes. That can be found in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruits of the Spirit. A godly life is someone who lives a holy life that is free from worldly lusts and sin that they've been delivered from when that person was a sinner. Their lives are one that also reflects God's glory and His grace in their lives. It is this grace that empowers the godly person to deny all ungodliness and worldly lust. Titus 2, 11 through 14. God's grace given to us when He sent Jesus Christ. His mercy and grace is still in work, not just for salvation. A godly life is also living your life wholly in accordance with God's word as a true believer in Jesus Christ who has has had their sins forgiven. Hebrews 12, 14. It means living in righteousness and godliness by Father God and Jesus Christ standards, which in turn will attract and bring their glory into your life. A person living a godly life will strive to glorify God in whatever they do and not themselves. It means you put God first. You seek Jesus Christ's will above your own. And everything you do, you want it to glorify God. You want people to see God. You don't care about if they see you or know you. You want them to see Jesus Christ, Father God, and them alone. That is a godly life too. And that should be seen in you. All right, the verse on that is 1 John 3, 22. It's living a life that embraces and accepts Father God and His Son Jesus Christ's way of how to live our lives. Rather than following the evil fleshly desire to sin, whose end result, if not repented of, is death and then a lake of fire. Romans six twenty three. It means you are not walking, chasing, or following after the flesh and the desires to sin, but after the Spirit of our Heavenly Father, who now helps us not to pursue these evil things, but righteousness. We're supposed to pursue righteousness, living a godly and clean life before God. But He helps us in all this. Galatians five sixteen through 18 when we are born again, saved by Jesus Christ, we are clothed with the garment of salvation and his robe of righteousness. That's in Isaiah 61.10. It's this righteousness of his that makes us holy and gives us the ability in part to live a godly life. Jesus Christ has given us everything. Father God has given us everything so we can live holy, clean lives, godly lives in him. Right, that's in Romans 5, 1. To live a godly life, one must choose to shun away from sin. Shun mean, means to um, push away from it, to shun it. Away from sin and choose to follow after righteousness. Because if sin is still present in your life, then you can't claim to be living a holy in, in life that's godly. You can't. If sin is present in your life, you are not living a godly, pleasing life. Verses to support that. Proverbs 14, 16. 2 Timothy 2, 16. And verse 22. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. 1 Timothy 6, 11. Living a godly life is also submitting or subjecting yourself to Father God and Jesus Christ's will for your life. And living in obedience to them, which includes keeping his commandments found in the holy word of God. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. And then there's other commandments in the New Testament. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet. 
Um, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, with all the mind, with all thy strength. We are to keep these. Keep the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Verses that support that about submitting yourself to God. James 4, 7. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. 1 Peter 5, 6. A godly life means living one of true repentance for past sins or present present that may occur. So when they happen, you repent. You don't let them lay and fester or grow and cause you to go into more sin. Proverbs 24, 16 and Proverbs 28, 13. Okay, I have one more apparently. It's through the grace of God we are saved and His grace teaches those choosing to live godly to deny all forms of ungodliness and worldly lust so that we can live soberly and righteously in this evil world. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, in which he says, My grace is sufficient to thee. And 2 Timothy 2, 1. And there's, um, I'm going to give you just a few examples because I'm going to read benefits of accepting Jesus Christ next. And I know this is going a little long, but this is what the Lord wanted. Examples of how living holy, other examples, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 19. And part of this is through the Word. John 17, 16 through 19. Psalms 119, 11. That one sticks out, but it's included in this other two. Psalms 119, 1 through 16. Romans 12, 1 through 2, which we read, the living sacrifice. And then living holy glorifies God. We glorify God when we live holy lives. Matthew 5, 16. Excuse me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I know this isn't my normal, but he wanted me to bring this out. And I have a little bit more. Bene this is just, I think, nine benefits. Nine benefits just right off because there's so many. Benefits for accepting Jesus Christ. A personal relationship with the living God, Jehovah, and His Son. That's enough for me, but, you know. Never-ending joy. Perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. Eternal life with Jesus and God in heaven. Life without condemnation. New life in Jesus Christ. Called a friend to Jesus. The Comforter is given and sent to us. We receive gifts by the Spirit. That's just a few of them. Hallelujah. That just, that, I, I was amazed. Well, not amazed, but... All right. What do you receive supernaturally and physically when you accept Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, this is the, oh, I've just been rejoicing. What do you receive supernaturally and physically when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You become a child of God through Jesus Christ. A child of God of heaven. Galatians 3, 26. You're heirs of God, sons and daughters. Once you accept Jesus Christ. Galatians 4, 7. And you are adopted into the kingdom of God. Galatians 4, 5 through 6. So, so far, you become a child of God. You become his heir. And you're adopted. Just as if you are the heir. You are blessed by God. Ephesians 1, 3. You're joined heirs with Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 17. Meaning, Jesus, the Son of God the rightful heir, you get the same thing that he does. And through Jesus Christ, we have all power. We have king access to the kingdom. We, we are blessed beyond blessed. You become ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 You are chosen and of the royal priesthood. You're a royal priest. 1 Peter 2, 9-10 through 10. You're treasured by God. Ezekiel 19.5 You're now a citizen of heaven. Philippians Philippians 3.20-21 You will judge angels. 
you know, putting in position of authority. First Corinthians six, three, you are Jesus Christ's friend. I keep going over this. Can't help it. John 15, 13 and 15. You are strong because of him. You have his strength. Philippians 4, 13. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. You have the strength to endure what he went through. All the agony of Calvary and all that because he's done it already and he lives in you. So whatever you're called to endure in these end time days, you do through what he's already suffered. His strength. You have his strength. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can do all things through Christ to strengthen me. Philippians 4, 13. Um, you become a new creation. You're no longer the old. Second Corinthians five seventeen, Ephesians four twenty four, and this is just for accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're redeemed from the curse of this earth. Galatians three thirteen, the curse of sin. The Lord now supplies your every need. Your needs make up the need. Philippians 4.19 You are set apart from the world. Hebrews 10.10 10, Deuteronomy 14.2 You're the light of the world now. Matthew 15.13-16 You are complete in Him. Colossians 2.10 How many before you were saved always felt like something was missing? Well, you're now complete through Jesus Christ. You're more than a conqueror. Romans 8, 37. You're the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Your body has become the temple or the dwelling place for the sweet Holy Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19. You're chosen by God. I think I may have done that one already. Chosen in a royal priesthood. But this is a different verse. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. This gets me excited because this shows me this is our inheritance. Part of our inheritance. You're now seated in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6. You're the workmanship of God. Ephesians 2, 10. You have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 16. Jesus Christ lives inside you. Galatians 2.20 You have been given all power over the enemy. Luke 10.19 Matthew 18.18 James 4.7 And Psalms 91.13 You're an overcomer by your testimony and the Lamb's blood. Revelation 12.11 1 John 4.4 4. You are not the tail, but the head. Deuteronomy 28, 13. You're the apple of his eye. Psalm 17, 8. Your enemy shall come at you in one direction and flee in seven. Deuteronomy 28. Again, this is accepting Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, and becoming part of the kingdom of God. You are confident and bold through Jesus Christ. Acts 28, 31. Ephesians 3.12, Proverbs 28.1. You are given the best armor, the armor of God. Ephesians 6.11-18. You are trained to fight by the Lord. Psalms 144.1 and Psalms 18.34. You're now a faith walker. 2 Corinthians 5.7. You now know the truth, and it freed you. John 8, 32. You're a discerner of spirits. 1 John 4, 1 through 3, 13 through 15, and 1 Corinthians 12, 3. You receive additional heavenly power. If and or when you are baptized by the sweet Holy Spirit, Acts 1, Eight, you are now protected by the living God, Jehovah. Psalms five eleven, 
Psalms 91, 1 through 10, and 14 through 15. You're now protected by his holy angels. Psalms 34, 7, Psalms 91, 11 through 12. You will suffer persecution. Matthew 5, 10 through 12, 2 Timothy 3, 12. You shall be hated by the world. Matthew 10, 22 and 24, 9 and Mark 13, 13. You will be betrayed. Psalms 27, 10, Luke 21, 16, Psalms 41, 9. You're now never alone. Matthew 28, 20, Hebrews 13, 5. God is now your helper. Hebrews 13, 6. You escape an eternity of horrible torment in a lake of fire if you keep your life godly. Revelation 20, 15, Matthew 25, 41 and 46. Revelation 20, 14. Your name is now written in the book of life. Revelation 20, 15. Revelation 3, 5 and Philippians 4, 3. And there's also the other benefits of, of being able to speak in the power of Jesus Christ's name. I, I, the Lord just wanted to remind everybody, yes, persecution's coming. Yes, these things are happening. Yes, you have to live a godly life. But he did not make it impossible. A lot of it is you have to choose to live godly and holy you have to choose you've been given free will you have to choose whether you're going to lay that sin down resist that temptation or whether you're going to embrace it and sin that's it that's it excuse me i think it's in first corinthians 10 13 or second corinthians where it says there's no temptation God does not tempt you. You get tempted when you take your eyes off the Lord. But in that temptation, He has given you a way to escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. We're in a sin nature flesh. Our flesh is sin nature. So we have before we accept Jesus Christ, have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of the Lord. But when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you do not have to sin anymore. And when these temptations come, even like when the thoughts, you reject them. And like if you're out in town, and you, I'm going to use um, like, like a man, for example, and, and there's an attractive looking woman, and you see in your look, but you turn. But if you take that second look, you are leaning into temptation. You're opening yourself up to be attacked. It says here, again, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And that can go for women too, women and men. It can change both ways. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. These are things we deal with all of our life. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. He's not going to give, let you be tempted more than you're able to stand. But with that temptation, always make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Meaning, he's going to give you the power and the, and, and the ability and the things to resist it and to choose no. Give you the ability, every opportunity to resist it through what you put in, the, the word of God, the teachings. But it's still your choice. What are you putting in? What are you choosing? Now, I understand there are some things people struggle with because there are spirits involved. Things like addiction. I understand, and I know people say that, that let me make this clear. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do not believe a true child of God can have their soul possessed. I do not. I believe parts of their bodies can be attacked and demonized, which means parts that you have opened up and given control. I do, because I've seen it, and I've seen people people that love Jesus Christ get delivered. 
that does not mean they are demon possessed. It means that area of their life has been attacked. They've opened some kind of avenue and they have not shut those doors. They are still access allowed to their life. That's how some, a lot of illnesses are. They can be generational. They can be you know, just all kinds of things. So when it comes to addictions and things like that, it is not always easy to break that if you don't understand. Because when, when I see, when we feed the homeless, and I've had people say, why are you feeding them? I mean, not all of them, but there's some of them that you know, as we call them, our junkies. They are addicted to drugs or they're addicted to alcohol and they're going to take, if you were to give them any money, they would take it and run for the next fix, which we don't give money. We give food, we give coats, we give, you know, whatever the Lord leads. But I have to look and say, they still need to be fed. They still need to re receive Jesus Christ. They still need that. They are bound by that spirit that is driving them. Now, the ones I'm talking about are actually not saved, the ones that we've run into. But it's an example of how that spirit that has control of that part of their life drives them. They don't want to be junkies. They, do, they don't want to be bound by an addiction that's controlling their whole life and running them. But it's because of the things and doors they've opened in their lives. It's because they've not accepted Jesus Christ into their heart. Now, I have seen a lot of people, when Jesus Christ comes into their heart, He takes everything away. He takes addictions. He takes um, cussing. He takes, you know, cleans them up all the way. And then there's others that they get saved, truly get saved. Holy Spirit, lead me. They truly accept Jesus Christ in their heart. And there is a change in their life. You can see the change. But still, what's a good example? They might still have a, a smoking addiction. I know people that, that have. But they truly love Jesus Christ. There's something in the past that they've not dealt with. That's giving legal access to their life. Because we all know these things are an addiction and bondage. And God is not, there's no bondage in Jesus Christ. So choices we make because we've been given free will. Every choice we make has a rippling effect throughout our lives. God is faithful. That's why a lot of times He will deal with us and He will point out, um, let's see, what's something? I I never really drank or done drugs or anything, but I used to love movies. I'm going to use that as an example. And it wasn't necessarily really the movies. I loved how they did the effects. That drew me in. Trying to figure out just that. I loved movies when I was growing up. To a point they were addictive to me. At one time, I had over 2,000 movies. Yeah, that was a time when I was dealing with depression and I went into, you know, drove into all that because I was running from the Lord. I still would try to talk with Him. But with all that had happened with my life that caused that period with my ex husband and stuff, with the, um, with, his leaving with another lady. That's all I'm going to say. With that happen, because I'd always been brought up in the church, I always believed you were supposed to stay married till death do you part. I had prayed continually, Father God, give me a love that will never die so that I can be faithful to the end. And, and all this, you know, and then this happened. When I should have been praying, Father God, give me a love to you, a love for you beyond all measure that will never die. You know, I know better now. <laughs> I know better now. But I had ended up, you know, collecting all these movies. That was an addiction. It was a bondage to me, too, because, you know, honestly, I couldn't afford the movies. But still, I was driven. But the Lord set me free of even watching the movies. Anything that you end up putting before the Lord is an idol and can become addictive in some sort or way. 
So when I, I started getting rid of the movies a little, I told him, he started, you know, clean it up, clean it up, daughter, clean it up. And I, I gave a few away, and then the Lord convicted me of that. And he said, if if you find these, and I find these offensive, why are you giving them to someone? So I started with the knife, and I'd go through every one of the CDs, you know, DVDs, and I'd, you know, and then throw them away. When I... Th when I threw the last one, these are worldly CDs, I did, uh, DVDs. I do have a few Christian movies. I very seldom watch them though. But when I threw the last one away, it was one of the greatest feelings I ever had. Is it was at that point I realized it was a bondage to me. I just thought I had to have the latest movie. I just had to have it. It was driving me more than getting in my Bible and sitting and reading those and, and watching those movies was was taking more place than trying to spend time with Jesus and trying to spend and and anything you put above Jesus Christ, Father God, is an idol. Whether it be something like watching movies, whether it be an addiction like cigarettes or drinking or, or sexual addictions or whatever, or even if it's family, friends, career, anything you put above Jesus Christ is an idol. And he doesn't take kindly to that. If you put anything before Jesus Christ and you're not fit for the kingdom of God, It says, whoever loves mother, father, daughter, son, you know, anything before me is not fit for the kingdom of God. We have to put Jesus Christ first and foremost. He has to be our everything. He has to come first. He has to come first. We have to learn to trust him for everything. We have to learn because with what's coming, we have to be able to run to him and say, Father God, I don't know how we're going to make it in Jesus Christ's name, but I trust you. And here's my family because I can't. I can't. And if you're not getting the word in it's going to be too late if we're too long. I don't know how else to tell you. Get the word in. Get in, in as much as you can. Read it. Listen to it. Get it in, get it in. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. That he will write it upon the tables of your heart. So that no matter if every copy in existence is removed, you have it inside your heart. And Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, will ensure it stays there and will keep it inside you. The, the pros outweighs the cons. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior does not mean you're letting go of all the good old days and all the good times. What it means is you're surrendering to the one who loves you the most, who's trying to save you from an eternity of pure torment because he loves you. Another, what I call fringe benefit of accepting Jesus Christ into your heart is having the power of his name. It's through everything Jesus Christ has done. Through the beating, the whipping. When they put the crown of thorns on his head, that was for your mental healing. That's why he tells me when I was going through all that depression that Jesus Christ delivered me from. Every, everything he did had a divine purpose that he allowed them to do. But when you speak in that name of Jesus Christ, understand this, child of God, you have the power of Jesus Christ, the power of God the Father, Jehovah, and the sweet Holy Spirit inside that name. You have the Godhead in it. And Colossians 2, 9-10 tells us that. I think the Lord wants to read that. And the way he explained it to me, Father God is a container of all power. He's infinite power. Jesus Christ, the Word, is the words that carry forth the power into being and into existence. Because it says Jesus Christ was Word made flesh in, in, 1 John, in John 1. And then the Holy Spirit 
the power of action that carries out the word and power into fruition until completion. They, they all three work together. But in, in Colossians 2, it actually tells that the fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus Christ. And there's other verses. But I like to read this one so that you can see. And the Godhead. Some people call it the Trinity. But it's actually called the Godhead. Trinity's not in the Bible. It's just the word that we've adopted. Just like rapture's not in the Bible. It's called catching away. But it means the same thing. But Godhead is my preference. Colossians 2, 9 through 10. I'm going to read 10 too. For in him, and we're talking about Jesus Christ. When you go up in um, verse 2, it identifies Father and Christ. And of Christ. And then 5, in your faith in Christ. In verse 6. And ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. We're talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 9. For in him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus Christ was all three. So that's all three in his name. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. He's over the all angels. All angels. Fallen angels, demons, holy angels. He's head of it all through what he did. And that's why through that power and everything he did, the fallen angels, the devils, the demons are subject to Jesus Christ. Even those hybrids with, with demons inside of them. The thing is, Everything is subject to the name of Jesus Christ. He has been given a name that's highly exalted. That one day at the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, when you read the other verses, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Now the decision is, are you going to do that now? Or are you going to be forced to do it on judgment day? Something to think about. Alright, I'm taking a long time. I didn't mean to. But, Lord, this is what you wanted. I know this is different than what I usually give, but we've got to remember who we are. And we have to really weigh ourselves. Are we an unprofitable branch? Are we a branch he's going to you know, cut off? Or are we a branch that, yes, he's going to prune and he's going to test, but he's going to make us bear more fruit. When you go through trials and you go through fires, if you're a child of God, that's what sends you to your knees and draws you closer to the Father. That's what gets you to reading the Word of God and looking for your help. Where does your help come from? My help comes from the Lord. But the, the tragedy of it all is a lot of us don't look to the Lord Jesus Christ or Father God until they're in trouble. And that's why we're in distress. And that's why persecution is coming. Trying is coming. Pruning is coming. Purging is coming. To get the bride ready. Because so many says we're ready. The Lord says you're not. I'm asking him to prune me and purge me anywhere he needs to be to. Because we are all. All. Fighting the battles. We're all in the sin nature body. None of us is better than the others. And I don't want anything hidden inside me that might keep me. From everything I've been called to do. In Jesus Christ's name. So I constantly pray. Holy Spirit. Search me. Search deep. Reveal the hidden things. Luke 8, 17. Luke 12, 2 through 3. And shine your light upon me like was shined upon Saul of Tarsus. So nothing can remain hidden. And then if there's something, help me to let it go. Help me to get it out. In Jesus Christ's name. So my life can glorify the Father, so my life can uplift and can just the life I'm leading can cause people to want this joy and this peace and this love that I have, which is only through Jesus Christ. All right. So please take all this to prayer to Jesus Christ. I love you, Lord. All I'm saying is please take what I've what I have given you. You ask the Lord to lead you. Ask Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to you one way or the other. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
now's the time. And if you sit there and listen to this, you see that the, the pros outweighs the cons. Because Jesus is a good, good God. Father God is faithful unto a thousand generations who keep his covenant and mercy. Deuteronomy 7, 9, to those that are his. I want to be a covenant keeper. I choose to be with his help. He is faithful, he is faithful, he is faithful. All right, so if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I ask you right now to please accept him into your heart and ask him to forgive you of your sins. And I'm going to say a short prayer. Please pray it with me in faith, believing. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. It's that simple. It's nothing you do. You don't have to clean yourself up. He'll do that. Just come as you are. Jesus Christ, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Wash me clean. Make me a new creation. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and that he gave his life on Calvary so I could go free. I believe he is born of a virgin birth that he rose again on the third day and he's coming back and I want to be part of that. I confess you before God and man here and now. Jesus Christ, I receive you into my heart. Amen. And it's that simple. It's that simple. And if you believe, if you really believe what you're praying, if you really ask, if you ask Jesus to come into your heart, he will. And he will change your life. He will change your life. He's amazing. He is loving. I had a lady um, send in an email, and I've not went into the email, prayer emails today or yesterday. But she was talking about how that this Jesus I'm talking about is a God of love, but yet angry. He is angry right now. I will tell you that. And the, the analogy the Lord gave me was, like we as parents, those of us that have kids or have grown up, and we keep pushing. You know, the child keeps pushing, pushing. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to get hurt. Don't do that. Don't do that. To the point that we get angry and we have to step in and we have to take care of business for the good of them and the good of all involved. That's a good representation. The only difference is we get angry in our flesh. Their anger is a righteous anger that is controlled not done in spiteful, not done in any way, that is done by weighing the balance. Okay, it's time. I call it their done point. I'm done. And I tell the Lord sometimes, I am done. And he says, here's a towel. Throws a towel. You, know, you throw the towel. I'm done, Lord. He throws it back in and says, you're not done yet. There you go. That's where we're at. <laughs> so hold on. Brace yourself. Get in the word. Study. Fast. Fasting is very important. Fasting is very important. It brings your body, you're denying your flesh, you bring yourself into subjection. And when you do that, you start denying your flesh. You can hear from God more clearly. You don't fast to hear from God clearly. You fast to bring yourself into subjection. You fast to deny this flesh, to deny yourself. And when you start doing all that, you're clearing away all the noise and you're going to be able to hear God better. That's the result. Because this flesh, it likes to eat. This flesh likes to do all this other stuff. Deny it. Deny your flesh. Deny your flesh. Spend time with the Father. Spend time with the one who loves you the most. Lay your cell phones down, your tablets, your computers. And take time to spend with your father before it's too late. And you're running for your lives if you're not ready when Jesus comes. God bless. Stay under the blood from Tennessee. 
Lord willing, I will be getting to the prairie mills. I understand this. I get to them as soon as I can. But if the Lord calls me set aside a, a day, two days to just pray, I will. You can contact me for prayer, for prayer only. Pray at mylovelyjesusministry.info and questions or anything else, even the ugly emails, which, like I said before, gives me access to you and open doorway to pray. Just whatever you want to do. Pray at mylovelyjesus.info is for the prayer. Questions at mylovelyjesus.info for everything else. Questions, anything else. All right, stay under the blood. Remember, Jesus loves you. I love you. My enemies, that you chose to make yourself my enemies, because I don't choose to make enemies, I forgive you. I do. And I love you. God bless. I'm Tennessee. Bye-bye.